Right now we are driving through the streets of Tel Aviv. Number one, the weather for today, maybe tomorrow as well, rainy, windy, cloudy. Uh, so we are going to enjoy the tail end of winter in this country. And starting tomorrow afternoon, it will start climbing the temperatures and warming up. actually two highways, but we'll stick to one that we'll call the Via Maris, or the way of the sea in Latin. So 
point of spider, this is a very important discovery. But this is the only place in the country or in the world that the name was found not in a piece of parchment or book, but in archaeology. Found in 1962. plays an, a very important role, biblically speaking. You know, you find almost no one today who has not heard the term Armageddon. We're sitting in church or we're looking, you know, we put our spiritual smile on and we're amen, brother, and we're high-fiving it and praising Jesus. No, no, what we are is when we're alone. And that's where the true battleground is. And in that moment in time, you will find out if you're a holy man or a holy woman or not. We are visiting now the location of Capernaum. The town was not very big. You see the ruins behind you over there. And we'll go to see the synagogue, which is the main building standing. The synagogues are big like churches. In there is also one above the other. And therefore, the very fourth century, under our feet, and we open the shaft over there, and you see outside there was a layer of black stone, basalt, which goes back to the days of Jesus. So we do know beyond any doubt. Where are we at? We may be a few feet above, but there's no question that this was the place where we healed the man with the withered hand and gave all his messages and healed Peter's mother-in-law, in believed to be where the church was erected later on. There's no question about it whatsoever. In Matthew chapter 16, uh, starting at verse 13, it says this. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? 
And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. To all these maneuver, tanks of riding right and left, it's really nice. Wow. I don't want to grow up the terror, it's like in Canada. The rock is obedience to the word. It's not hearing even the word, it's doing what it says. So, we just listened to some, so Sermon on the Mount says turn the other cheek. If you're in the midst of a relational trial and you're not turning the other cheek, you have no reason to expect that your house won't fall. The confidence in the rock is the doing what it says. The confidence in the rock is in the doing what it says. We've been through some very, very difficult, difficult seasons. And I'm telling you, the thing that allows you to go another day is, we're going to do what Jesus, I don't know what else is going to happen, but we're going to flat out do what Jesus says. We're going to handle persecution the way he says to handle it. We're going to handle uh, false accusation the way he says to handle it. We're going to handle health crisis the way he says to handle it. We're going to do what Jesus says. That's the only way to keep your feet on the rock. Now, don't ever forget that for your whole life. When you remember being in Israel, think about this. There is no reasonable confidence for our ability to not fall beyond our decision to do what Jesus says. That's how we handle things.
Jesus was with them, do you remember? And uh, Peter said, uh, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. That was in response to Jesus saying, you know, let down your nets for a catch. He was like, really? Really? You're going to teach us to fish now? I mean, we don't know a lot, but this is the one thing we know. Why don't you stick to preaching? We're, we're kind of on the fish thing, which is a remarkable assertion on Peter's part because almost every time in the Gospels, they catch nothing. And they kind of needed a career change. And, and so... Uh, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. I love this in Luke chapter 5. Nevertheless, at your word, we will let down the nets. And what, what an what a awesome, awesome point. God, I don't know why you'd ask me to do this. It doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't seem like the thing that I should do. I'm relying upon the little bit of experience that I have. And your idea just doesn't seem great. Nevertheless, at your word, I will. That is an awesome, awesome point of submission. Now, that wasn't about the Sea of Galilee, and that wasn't about boats or about fish. That was about Jesus Christ reaching into their context and drawing a lesson uh, out for them. And, of course, the miraculous catch of fish followed, and, in fact, Peter was so overcome by the revealing of the deity of the Son of God that his response to the miraculous catch of fish was, Depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. And how you're going to separate the people are the people who get down and drink like a dog would drink from the uh, from water those are the people you're gonna send home now you can imagine Gideon saying please don't right don't do it don't do it and the people who sit up and they bring the water to their mouth those are the people who are gonna stay so now we're told that there's 300 people left 135,000 of the enemy, 300 people left, okay? Imagine how Gideon feels there. must visit three sites and fully understand what stands behind those three sites. Masada is one of them, the western wall is the second one, and the Holocaust Museum is number three. It's an opinion, all right? You won't find it in books. If you connect these three together, that will give you a very good understanding, in a very profound way, about our past, our present, our future, our national identity, and our religious one as well. So the story behind Masada is not just the beauty of the desert, and it's not just amazing history, Masada is a symbol. A 
and with the Zerots made this their home for about seven years, 960 men, women, children. Country. How many Americans, Australians, Canadians, just mention your nationalities, died and are willing to die for the freedom of the country? So we're not unique in that perspective, but we are back here after so many years of exile. You see, as long as Jews focus on religion, Jewish heroes are rabbis, scholars, people of the book. When you focus on the nation, you want to connect with King David, with Gideon, with mighty heroes. And the zealots in Masada delivered the clear message. So clear it was that we can relate to that today as a nation. And therefore, freedom of death, that's a simple message. Maybe the most famous slogan from Israel is Masada shall never fall again. It's not Masada, it's the state of Israel. Masada is representing what we believe in. The most complete Jewish Bible, so to speak, was written in Tiberius, most likely was vocalized. Remember the dots and dashes not having vowels in our language? In Tiberius, it's in the museum as well. It's from the 10th century. Some people said 10th century. Mm. Is it possible if something was added to it, maybe taken out? Where is the proof? Well, overnight, scrolls were found, a thousand years older than the oldest. Mm. You compare that to our text today, it's almost identical. Mm. So if proof was needed, the Dead Sea Scrolls are the proof. Mm. December of 1947, a shepherd boy was on his way from Bethlehem down to the Dead Sea. He realized that he's missing all of his sheep. And just like any other good shepherd, he lived in 99 and go to look for the one. So after he throws some rocks and stones into the cave, tried to find out maybe he'd find a sheep, and then he heard this clinking sound of the rock hitting something that was another rock, but it was a little odd. Went inside the cave and he found jars, about seven jars, in them pieces of fabric, and inside the fabric, scroll. Welcome to Jerusalem. Jesus said, if it is possible, let this cup pass away from me. And uh, so, of course, theologians have debated what was in the cup. And uh, let me just say that it was uh, not the fear of death. Uh, men, not half uh, 
who Jesus Christ was have faced death with courage. It was not the fear of death. And uh, others have said, well, it was the uh, pain of death. Not at all. Uh, people have uh, suffered uh, death uh, more painful and excruciating as martyrs even than Jesus did. Uh, what was in the cup was, the scripture says, uh, he became a sin for us who knew no sin. If you know anything in your growth in grace of what it is to become repulsed by something that used to rouse you, to be, to be, uh, to find revolting what you used to find attractive. If you've come to see that sin is everything that God says it is, uh, destructive and evil and hurtful to your soul and to your body, then you can imagine what the perfect Son of God saw when he saw sin. And when he saw God's judgment being poured out upon him, and when he anticipated the separation within the Trinity that had never existed before. These are the things that were in the cup. And, and in, his, well, in his deity, uh, he uh, purposed to come and offer himself in his humanity, as anyone would with a great task in front of them. He, he was not up to it. And so he came here with that perplexity in his heart. And again, I would just invite you to uh, draw to your mind, what is that in your life? standing now, listen carefully, not on bedrock, on a man-made platform, about 90 to 80 to 90 feet above bedrock. So there's a lot of hollow spaces and air under our feet. Bedrock is Mount Moriah. That's the chosen location. And David makes a preparation. You can clearly sense in the scriptures he did not trust. That's what the Bible says. He did not trust his young in experience on Solomon. He's the one that makes the deal about purchasing cedar wood from Lebanon. He's the one who trains the stonemason. David makes all the preparation, but he's not the builder. Solomon is the one that builds the temple. The eastern gate is over there. All right, the eastern gate now is filled up with stone. 
if you were standing here when the temple was open and people could come as a daily business from east into the temple area, for example, from Bethany, which is right behind the hill, then you could see through the gate and you would see the bridge. Let's cross the keep to the other side, remember? It's a great opportunity to show the Muslim world that we conquered Jerusalem not because we are going to destroy the Muslim holy sites. They started a war, we retaliated, we were prevailed, we conquered the city, but we're not going to destroy Muslim holy places because Israel is indeed a free country and we do respect their right to worship. We were hoping that that will lead to some reconciliation. We thought that this is a good way to build bridges, to show the others that it's not a religious issue. How wrong we were, now I can tell you. But 45, 46 years ago, it looked like the right thing to do. Democracies do respect the sanctuaries. They do grant freedom of religion. And Israel is indeed a democracy. Now it's a way to change anything. And maybe there's no need to change anything, because as we said, only God knows the time. So people in this country, some are upset, etc. And you do understand those sentiments as well. Because today, the Muslim world is making out of Temple Mount much more than ever before. Because of politics, not that much about religion. You need to understand how you're using those tools. But it's always a hot spot, always a place of conflict. And it's nice and kind of, the breeze is nice and it's kind of a beautiful day. Don't let this mislead you. We speak about kind of a volcano. Every now and then it erupts. Every now and then there's a lot of problems. And the problems are not around Israel or Jerusalem. Temple Mount, Temple Mount, Temple Mount. The way that we see our rituals is that we cannot reach today the degree of purity required to go up to Temple Mount without having the ashes of the red heifer. And therefore the closest we can come to the Holy of Holies without violating the mountain because we are not pure enough is to come to the Western Wall. When the excavation started, the streets of Jerusalem were at the elevation of the stone that sticks out from the wall over there. Is that clear? Yes. When we visited the prayer plaza, we were at the same elevation as the stone is. In order to be able to come down here, it took 25 years of work, removing half a million tons of dirt. There aren't that many places in the world we can be so certain about what we see. Jesus walked on these stones like any other Jerusalemite and any other pilgrim that came to town. Because this was the main street and the main marketplace just outside. Adoi 
First time ever, so there was no way out, no option. If you were Jewish, you'd want this and that's to die. That was something that the Nazis invented. And also, to make the whole anti-Semitic argument on a racial base and to try to prove it genetically, that's something that never happened before. You know, they invested a lot of money in research to try to prove that Jewish skulls are a little different than the others, and the noses a little longer. And therefore, look at that, huh? And therefore, they won't qualify to be humans, so they are sub-humans, Untermensch in Germany. And if they are sub-humans, we don't have to treat them like humans. When you elevate that, quote-unquote, to the level of a whole philosophy, and you educate a generation of children that they are the master race and the others are not, and you can prove it so-called genetically, well, we have a major problem. That was never done before. The main lesson from the Holocaust should be if somebody says he's going to kill you, trust him, he will, unless he's talking first. We are learning.
Jesus says, do you want to be made well? Doesn't he say that to everyone? And the reason I'm bringing this up is because as we sit here, I was just speaking to a lady from Madrid, Spain, and I told her, I said, as we sit here, there's nothing more important than what we could talk about right now than where you're going to spend eternity, okay? And here's what I, I just want to say this, humbly say this, here's, here's what I found. There are a lot of people like me. I was trusting in my system. Now, maybe your system is, well, I'm obeying the commandments. Jesus, and later in Jeff, uh, John chapter 5 says, you put your hope in Moses, and it's Moses who's going to accuse you on the last day. You're putting your hope in something that, that's going to accuse you. Some people are like, well, I'm a good person. Some people are, well, I'm a Jew. Some people are like, well, I'm a Catholic. That's my, what is your system? And, and here's what I found. I have found that I wasn't the, I'm not the only person who was walking around who said, I believe in Jesus, but I wasn't a Christian. Okay? God's Word says, test yourself to see if you're in the faith. Or do you not recognize this about yourself? That Christ is, is, is in, indeed within you. brought Jesus first. They took him to the house of Herod Antipas, who refused to deal with him, brought him back here, and that's where the beating, the cross, the crown of thorns, and the beginning of the way of the cross is. Please look at all those holes that you see around. These are bullet holes, and these are a reminder to the heaviest battle that took place in Jerusalem in the War of Our Independence, 1948-1949. One of my my clear vision memories when I was only nine years old, the city was still divided. And the closest we could come, the Jews, to see the area of the Western Wall was to come to this rooftop. This was the highest place in the area accessible for everybody because it was a public area. And from here we knew that the Western Wall is someplace over that direction because we could see the Dome of the Rock. So the closest anybody could come until 1967 for the Jewish side to see the Jewish holy side was standing up on this rooftop.
and we believe that when Jesus' body was placed in the tomb, it was placed on the shelf at the back. We told that when the women looked in, looking for Jesus' body, they looked to the right, across that way. Woman, why are you weeping? He is not here. You can't you kind of see the angel up there? The coolest part of it to me isn't even the opening. They, they should lose those flowers. <laughs> Doesn't need to be decorated. The coolest part over there is that kind of little outcropping up above where I can just see that angel kind of. <laughs> not here, he's risen, like he told you. Get over, he's where he said he'd meet you. Now we know what it meant. He's going to meet you in Galilee. Get it? Turn to your neighbor and say, I get it. Get it. He's going to meet you Get it. And, and, and what, a, what an awesome, awesome, awesome thing. The Bible tells us that David was coming down, running down from that hill, refusing to wear Saul's armor. Saul said, listen, I'm the only one that has a decent armor. You wear it when you go to this dogfight. And David tries it and says, I'm not very comfortable in this. So just as he was with a slingshot, with a small pouch, running down, crossing the brook, picking up five smooth stones, the Bible tells us, to face the Philistine in the valley. And you know, of course, how the story ended. The Bible tells us that David chopped Goliath's head and took his head and the sword to Jerusalem. And this became to be a day of great victory. And the Israelites pursued the Philistines all the way to the gates of Gath, about 20 miles down this road. King David, King <laughs> David there, King David. The manifest presence of God in Scripture is a overwhelming sense of my own unworthiness. And I, I, is, is it going to explode? We just need to know. We can, we can, if you can't swim, locate someone near you who can. Are we good? So try to jump in with a sound effect every so often if you can. <laughs> uh, 
in the water with lessons. He was on the water with lessons. The timing was perfect. The timing's perfect. It's good. If they do this, the boat drivers do this when they're under conviction, so pray for them. <laughs> then, then, uh, so it's all good. Should I just give the invitation now or should I keep going? <laughs> <laughs> That's right, she doesn't want anything else, so. so did I cut not sure what to say. Nice try, though. Right. Did I cut Somebody buy something from this guy. Hey, Lisa. This man right here actually sleeps on my. He said he was, honey, I, honey, if I trip over this again, we're burning it. So, so if he could buy her one of those, it would be nothing to him. <laughs> don't listen to him. I don't want one. Thank you. Yeah, I'll reach, but I'll reach. Really he's, so, he's such a good guy, he might buy one for somebody else. <laughs>